Okay, welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. As always, I am your host, Patrick. It is a rainy Friday afternoon. My recording schedule, if you want to call it that, is a little off. I've been busy with grown-up stuff all week. Uh, fun fact about me, for the duration that I've been doing this most of the time, I, uh, I've been working nights. I work during the week. 9 p.m. till 6.30 a.m. So there's a good chance that if you're watching a video of me, I am whacked out of my mind on lack of sleep. Which, that seems fitting for the update I'm about to record right now. I'm going to be talking about noisy, discordant hardcore. Um, the gears started turning about uh, talking about this kind of stuff around me, wrapping around the time of me, wrapping up the metallic hardcore video that I did about a month ago. Right about there, I was starting to kind of grab a few things from Discogs. Uh, I had a few other things that I didn't talk about yet that were kind of in the back of my mind. So I've got a small pile of um, stuff that kind of falls under a couple of different categories, none of which I really particularly like the names of. Namely, uh, scrams is the modern term because Screamo uh, got more commercially leaning as, as a genre name throughout the mid-2000s with bands like Silverstein, etc. Uh, My Chemical Romance, I think, was called Screamo. So I, I started just kind of craving this kind of discordant, noisy, fast hardcore that in a lot of ways kind of overlaps with and has a Venn diagram with uh, grind and power violence and fast core from the 90s, uh, particularly focusing on a lot of stuff from San Diego, a couple of bands from Europe, uh, traditionally, there was some of the stuff that sonically kind of uh, merges with this that came from New Jersey and New York, although I won't be talking about any of those bands. I did cover some of this related stuff years ago. I mentioned this in the Metallic Hardcore update. I talked about some of this stuff on an older update where I talked about uh, some emo stuff, some Gravity Records stuff, same kind of stuff. The stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this update is a lot more kind of grind sounding, a lot faster, blast driven kind of stuff, along with um, just straight up old school grind, like Agathocles and SOB. I've been craving this kind of noisier stuff. Um, so I'm not really comfortable, and I don't really like the term screamo or scrams. Emo violence is kind of funny especially if you consider that Emotional Violence is the name of a, a cameo record, which I believe the people who originally coined the term emo violence were aware of. Um, or at least that's what I what I saw when I Googled kind of the history of it. It's a niche kind of grouping of bands, some of which I'll be talking about. Anyway, I don't like any of these titles, um, so I'm going to make up my own genre name. Since we've been discussing the genealogy of genres, the last couple of uh, updates on here. The new term for this pile of stuff is Scrarmivalence. These are all my favorite Scrarmivalence bands, and it's mostly stuff that I've picked up recently. Uh, I've basically been Trojan horsing collection updates to you. I don't want to call them collection updates because that's just a generic thing. Most of my collecting and, and acquisitions of CDs and vinyl and tapes is kind of pathological. I am usually going down a weird wormhole, so I figure I can kind of convert it into a topic. So anyway, that's my rant. Um, part of what inspired this was, again, the end of shooting that video, having a couple more things in mind. I talked about Scrotum Grinder from Florida. I also talked about Inhumanity from around these parts, well, South Carolina. <laughs> We're in Humanity from Columbia, South Carolina. This is Double Digit Fun by Inhumanity from Columbia, South Carolina. And I started craving more stuff that was along those lines and some kind of loosely related other types of music that was relatively close. I was craving a lot of blasty, noisy stuff. I've noticed that the common ground that a lot of these bands share that I'm going to be talking about, there's a couple of key elements. Um, one of them is really odd rhythmic approaches. Uh, there's blast beats and thrash beats in a lot of these, but there's these kind of weird choppy brat da 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 brat da 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 kind of stuff with a lot of this like screamo-ish type of music. Sorry, scrumivalent music. Um, there's a, a big sense of like massiveness to it, almost kind of an epic sound, particularly with Orchid. There's a lot of um, octave chords going on. 
uh, there's a, a weird parallel to noisy black metal, how noisy black metal can sound really huge, even though a lot of it's not recorded very well. Uh, there's a lot of goofy, long, sarcastic song titles, which was very much the flavor of the decade <laughs> between, I want to say, like, 95 and 2005. So I think the originator was Charles Bronson, who certainly also have a lot of crossover with this kind of stuff. There's a lot of jarring off-time stuff. There's a lot of loud, kind of scronky, slightly distorted bass. <laughs> I feel like a lot of it's kind of influenced equally by noise rock. Uh, obviously, a lot of this stuff is heavily inspired by the Revolution Summer DC stuff. There's the quieter moments of some of these bands definitely reminds me of some of that stuff. Definitely reminds me of Fugazi in weird ways. Um, like I mentioned, grindcore and power violence. Uh, certainly the noisier hardcore bands, I feel like, left their mark on this scene void being a big one maybe united mutation um i feel like united mutation was a band that people dug up way later didn't really wasn't really known by a lot but who knows you know i know a lot of these guys in these bands were uh record collector nerds and i feel like the, a lot of these bands were the spiritual successor to a lot of the more outsider leaning weirdo things going on in hardcore punk in america in the 90s you know, you have for every agnostic front and negative approach and negative effects, all the East Coast um, early hardcore bands that were really mean and straightforward, or even Crucifix, who were, you know, coming from a different place politically, but were also very straightforward, or Battalion of Saints. For all that stuff, there was stuff that was a lot more weird and out there uh, that just fell under the banner of hardcore, namely like the Minutemen and the Dicks and the Big Boys and weird stuff like uh, the Crusafooks, <laughs> we'll say. Still within the first couple minutes of the video, you know, got to play that game. Even the effigies, you know, all this stuff that kind of fell under different banners. Uh, no Means No from Canada that was kind of trying different things and still fell under hardcore punk because it was actively rebelling against the status quo and playing underground music. I feel like when hardcore went into different directions in the 90s, it kind of fell into these different buckets and kind of went its separate ways. You had people keeping the punk spirit alive, whether it was street punk or crust. You had first youth crew and then all the metallic stuff that evolved into. I feel like the spirit of like kind of intellectualism and experimentation was kind of kept alive during that period from the, uh, I'd say early to mid nineties, all the way into the two thousands. So that's, what I feel like a lot of this stuff kind of comes from. Um, that being said, there is a kind of a staple thing kind of holding these together. Although there's a few outliers where the connective tissue gets a little loose and I just kind of threw it in there because it was part of my buying spree. Now, the other thing that kind of got me going down this, this route of wanting to check out more of this stuff, I think the biggest band to come out of this scene was The Locust. And I have a weird formerly adversarial relationship with that band. Um, up until, I, I mean, it was only, I think it was October. Uh, it was the same, it was the weekend before Halloween. I set up a booth at the Raleigh Punk Rock Flea Market selling records. Came across another booth from Lunch Meat VHS who was selling this. They put this out. This is the documentary on The Locust. Now, The Locust were one of those bands that I really disliked for reasons I'll mention in a moment when they were around and then just kind of stopped thinking about after a while. And then somewhere in the back of my mind, part of my brain said to itself, you should really go back and check them out again. And kind of, you dropped your old prejudices. You like a lot of the related stuff. You should probably give the locust the treatment as such, which means checking out all their stuff. And I did. I didn't watch this for months after I bought it. I have a nice, retro quote unquote heavy air quotes retro setup in uh, my my music room here with a nice big old crt and a vcr 
Uh, so about a month or two ago, I, you know, I was up late because I'm on a nocturnal schedule. The family had gone to bed, and I made some popcorn and watched this, and it's great. I mean, I'm familiar with. This is specifically a documentary on Justin Pearson, not just the Locust, the the brain behind the Locust, as well as a bunch of other bands. Uh, more recently, Retox, Dead Cross. Swing Kids, Struggle, a few others that I'm not remembering. It's about his life, um, but heavily about the Locust as well, and the San Diego scene, which was a really brilliant, unique scene that they came from, as well as other bands, Mohinder, Antioch Arrow, um, Heroin. You know, I'm going to be talking about a handful of those. And this really captured my imagination, had a lot of really intense personal stuff about Justin's life, a lot of his inspirations, um, and talked about how you know, what went into forming the Locust, the influences, everything from no wave to Devo to jazz to grind, obviously. It made me want to buy up a whole bunch of stuff kind of revolving around this band, other bands orbiting it, other bands that they were involved with. Um, unfortunately, with every kind of deep dive on stuff like this, there's a sad revelation. I was unaware of the fact that their drummer, Gabe Serbian, passed away just two years ago. He was about the same age I am, so that's always heartbreaking to see. Um, rest in peace to him. I also forgot briefly that early cattle decapitation was more or less a, a locust side project um, when there were three piece with him on drums. And as a result, I got those first couple of records too, which are really, really cool because it's a weird 3-1-G records take on Gore Grind before they became what they are now. Um, digression. So anyway, I would recommend checking this out. Uh, this is sold out, the super you know, fancy pants VHS. I know it's available on DVD. I believe the streaming service it's on is Vimeo. I don't know if it's not available on anything else. Maybe yeah. maybe Amazon by now. Um, knowing maybe the Locust and their sort of generally anti-corporate sort of approach, they might have elected to not put it on Amazon. I don't know. But that's my general ramble about why I'm doing this and my thought process and why I wanted to explore this music. So to get to the daddies of, I feel like, the originators correct me if i'm wrong i tried to trace the the lineage of who really kind of pioneered that the screamy kind of sound i mean you can trace back to more than one band obviously there's never just one i think rorschach and born against kind of had their hand in creating this sound too i think specifically the san diego sound was definitely heroin but before that i don't know if there was anybody really i know there were some dc bands and stuff like that that kind of created the structures, but I'm a student as much as I am a, an educator. Oh, Jesus, that sounds pretentious. I'm a student of this stuff as much as anybody else. So if, uh, you know, if you have any ideas, I'm still kind of new to a lot of this stuff, even though I've been aware of it for over 25 years. So if you have any, uh, any ideas who might have like kind of helped pioneer this sound other than heroin and the others I'll be talking about, um, let me know. But this is the heroin discography. Southern Lord is just cranking out discographies and reissues of hardcore bands lately. I don't even know if they do stoner metal stuff anymore. Um, they did Virulence, they did Uniform Choice, Neon Christ, all this, all this hardcore stuff. Um, this is great. I mean, it's just such a cool, weird mix of styles. It's a lot faster than I remembered it when I was going through, as I mentioned, when I was making the... Uh, metallic hardcore video i went back to listen to heroin and they're way more punk and fast than i remember but there still is all that kind of um occasionally jangly kind of elements that feel sort of indie-ish but screaminess a um, lot of off-kilter stuff rhythmically a lot of bombast very very cool very thoughtful lyrics this is a nice really gorgeous thick double gatefold lp I think I just got black vinyl. I usually do. Yeah. But there's the center labels. Uh, sounds great. I believe it's remastered. Sounds massive. Highly recommended if you want to explore stuff like this. Just like everything else, I'm going to put links to everything I can find in the uh, description below. I try to put links to band camps if I can, just in case you want to support the artist, you know, buy their stuff. Um, I'll also put links to uh, Gabe Serbian's Memorial Fund as well. Um so support the bands. And also, while I'm 
shilling for the bands, I will shill for myself and ask you to subscribe if you haven't and comment and share and all that crap. Another discography that I picked up, this band was more around, uh, actually they were around up until like two or three years ago I found out, which is wild. Uh, Milwaukee band, Seven Days of Samsara. Another double LP. Uh, nicely put together. I always liked this band because they did the DIY um, album layout thing like a lot of bands did at the time. I found that Back in the day, the emo bands and the DIY bands and, and even some of the kind of more metal-leaning bands that were adjacent to all this, like Ottawa and Jihad and stuff, would put their stuff out on um, like recycled materials, on lunch sacks and like brown paper, and they would string stuff together with yarn and all kinds of wild stuff. The early Ebullition releases were like that. Uh, and it got to be a little bit of a, a trope after a while. The cool thing about Seven Days of Samsara, their CD, I'll put a picture of it if I can find it online. I'm sure it's up there. Uh, they would they would press stuff on like sheet metal, which was super hard, <laughs> like almost like, you know, an industrial style, you know, and they don't have anything metal in this. They actually sent me a, a flyer for one of their shows that was screen printed on, on sheet metal. I have it somewhere. Yeah, it's right here, actually. That's pretty cool, you know? Neat. Um, this is actually, you know, photocopied. Really nice looking and everything, but it's on a priority mail mailer, so that kind of keeps the spirit alive of that DIY kind of thing. I definitely hit the mic there. Sorry. Still not really totally pro. I'm working on it. But, yeah, nice, huge booklet. Um, every show they played is on this, which is really cool. Their music has that very chaotic, um, bombastic, uh, scattershot rhythm kind of thing. Uh, it's a little bit heavier than a lot of the other bands I'm talking about. It's a bit more metallic. It feels like it verges between that, that sort of... Um, Scrumivalence <laughs> sound that I described earlier and uh, like metallic hardcore. You can say that this would probably appeal to fans of Converge and uh, Cave In and stuff like that. It's just, and not to mention that, I mean, Converge, I'd say definitely was influenced by a lot of this stuff too, come to think of it, as heavily as they were by Rorschach and others. This is kind of in between that metallic hardcore and that scattershot. Um, you know, part screamy post-hardcore stuff. I talked about Inhumanity during that Metallic Hardcore update. I have to really try hard not to flip this around because there's a naked dude on the back. Censored by like a little football over his, his junk, but there's a naked guy on the back in a bathtub. The record that I talked about was their second LP, The History Behind the Mystery. This is the debut by Inhumanity, The Nutty Antichrist. Um, I saw it at Sorry State and it was uh, going for a song, so I snagged it. I talked about their discography as well, so I covered it, but I thought I'd just mention them again, how cool they were. They were from Columbia, South Carolina. This came out on Passive Fist Records, uh, mid-90s. But they were a very uh, irreverent band, very funny, very thoughtful, kind of social, socially provoking lyrics and stuff. Um, kind of dark, you know? There's like a lot of like applauding people who took their own lives because they're you know, not spreading humanity any further, that kind of sort of black pill view on stuff. Also, really early lyrics talking about, like, gender roles and stuff, which these topics have been around for ages. Just because people are all up in arms about it now doesn't mean it hasn't been in the conversation uh, previous to three or four years ago. But, yeah, interesting social topics, political stuff, some really funny merchandise. There's uh, joke t-shirts in here. Very much like the style, again, uh, the... The style of the time with uh, the DIY stuff, hard to read, crammed in, typewriter font, probably made on a real typewriter. There's all sort of kind of like occult references and nods in this. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Lewis, as you can see, was on the cover. Dear Jerry, don't sue. We are big fans and are all physically and or mentally challenged. Um, I can't well, let's see if I can find it. There's a lot of stuff in here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um. A few of these that I'm not going to read off <laughs> just for, you know, for fear of being demonetized or whatever. The, not real t-shirt designs, but my favorite one is I hate Hank Williams Jr. and I'm gay. <laughs> so a lot of uh, 
turn war around, make it raw. <laughs> um, yeah, just funny, funny, jokey kind of stuff, but also talking about serious topics, you know. Musically, it's it's very explosive. Um, the second record gets a little bit more hypnotic and, like, weird and kind of leaning into the occult themes a little bit more. This is uh, basically, like, when you think of the term emo violence, you can see where they were coming from with this. It's got that sort of, like, really, really stop-start, scatter shot again, um, blasting, super obnoxious vocals, blistering, you know, could easily play a bill with Spaz and Charles Bronson, but it's got those sort of discordant elements that are a little bit more um, closer to what people would maybe consider emo or post-hardcore. So the members of that band, Inhumanity, formed Guyana Punchline, which is... <laughs> it's a uh, Guyana Punchline, pronounced Guyana Punchline. I looked it up. I, I never had to say that name. I don't know why. I've never really watched the Jim Jones documentaries, I guess. Guyana. Punchline. One of my favorite band names currently. The name of this is Irritainment. I think it's their first. It might be their second. Did not uh, jot that down in my notes. But really, really great stuff. I think it's it's cool how they expanded on the concept of their previous band. Um couple of the members and a few members from Initial State and Anti-Schism, I believe. All South Carolina stuff. This is kind of doing what a few bands were doing at the time, including Dead Guy, which is looking back on, on mid-century sort of motifs and, and tropes and stuff and reflecting back like how kind of nightmarish and weird and unnatural that stuff feels, at least in retrospect. Um, musically, again, it's it's got a lot of the same sort of stuff going on as far as the chaos goes, but there's a lot more kind of weird, quiet moments. Um, there's a lot, a bit of groove in there. There, I feel like there's some kind of indie stuff creeping in. some noise rock creeping in lots of songs um quick quick songs though there's like over 20 on here 21 22 songs a few live parts um i feel like there's a a philosophy behind this the whole irritainment thing smashism apparently was the the sort of like cult like philosophy that they developed it felt very like church of the subgenius to me if you know anything about that the whole misinformation slack church of bob thing that was big in the 80s and 90s seems inspired by that kind of deal um kind of love that but yeah I, i've noticed that sort of mid-century kind of thing leaking through a lot with um bands in the late 90s early 2000s kind of as the american dream started to erode you know people kind of look back to, at the 50s and was like this is a nostalgia for a time that never existed this was pretty weird and Okay, so we'll get into CDs. I already babbled at length and gushed about the Locust. Um, I didn't mention, actually, why I disliked them, so let me do that now. Around 99 or 2000, the Locust played Boston. They played at a place that had... It was a DIY venue that had shows for a while. That was a big, gigantic bric-a-brac place called buck pound This was one of those places you'd go to that was a consignment shop or thrift store or whatever. It was a huge place. It was like in a warehouse kind of space, two floors, if I'm remembering right, where you would go to certain areas and there were just piles of stuff everywhere, mostly clothes, but also other random shit, toys, whatever. And you could pay a dollar a pound for the whatever you could find. Certain areas, you couldn't do it with everything. I think there was more expensive vintage stuff. But... When bands would play, they would clear all, all the mountains of clothes and crap, and bands would play in the middle of it. I don't think they had shows there for very long, um, but it was always neat to go to shows there. It was a cool space. 
Don't know if it's still around. Boston's been gentrified to hell, so probably not. But the Locust played there with Fat Day, who I adored. Great Boston band. And I didn't know much about them, um, but I was really impressed with them live. They were at the beginning of their whole shtick with their costumes. They had a strobe light and, uh, you know, the keyboards, the sci-fi keyboards going. And it was just amazing because there's just stuff flying through the air. Like punks getting in fights with squeaky hammers, squeaky inflatable hammers. Uh, a couple of punks that I knew did the like three-legged race thing where one guy was in a pair of pants, it was a huge pair of pants, and the other guy put one leg in and they were like a big mutant two-headed thing moshing. It was just fun. Um, but after they played, this phenomenon happened with a lot of stuff that becomes very trendy and popular very quickly, where a lot of people I knew who were either straight edge kids or like crust punks or whatever. And I mean, it, it feels embarrassing to even talk about this because it's so late teens, early twenties. Like, what did we, why did we care about this? But I noticed that a ton of kids jumped on that train with the, the Spock haircuts, which was the style of those bands. Um, seemingly overnight, you know, we're kind of uh, not really into the stuff they were into before. And a few of my friends were catching attitude from them here and there. Again, everybody was very young, late teens, early 20s. It, but there was a, a whole thing of like, these guys think they're too cool for school. It also seemed to be the very beginning of the whole hipster thing. I feel like there was a direct evolution between the white belts and the super tight, you know, ironic thrift store t-shirts into what eventually became the Williamsburg thing a few years later. I think you can directly correlate the two. And there were just incidents where I, one kid who was particularly into this style and loved the Locust, I walked into, well, I worked with the guy. I walked into the coffee shop that I was working at with him and he was wearing a really nice vintage, I mean, it'd be considered vintage in like $300 now, but at the time I'm sure he found it for like a dollar at a thrift store. He was wearing a vintage Destruction Mad Butcher shirt. And I was like, dude, I love that band. I was like, what's your favorite record? And, you know, wasn't trying to three songs him. I just was excited that somebody else knew who Destruction were. Because at that point, I knew, like, two or three other punks that were into that kind of metal. And the kid just was like, oh, I didn't, I don't, I don't know what they sound like. I just like the shirt. And I was so offended by that. <laughs> he was dismissive about it. Again, young, naive, you know. But, you know, poser shit, man. Makes you angry. You know, there's, there's grown-ass adults that are very mad about that kind of stuff to this day. So... Anyway, I, I just kind of wrote The Locust off, which is weird because I liked all their previous bands. Um, it wasn't specifically just that. I mean, just their popularity and certain things about how they affected stuff just was very unappealing to me for a few years, and then I just kind of forgot about it. But I, like I said, I liked, uh, I liked their previous bands. I really, really liked Swing Kids, um, but for whatever reason, I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't get into The Locust. I refused to for a while, and then I just kind of forgot about it. So fast forward to buying that cassette and uh, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I need to revisit this band to the, said to the lunch meat guy. And he's like, dude, if you like grind, it's like faster than a lot of grind bands. So here we are after reconsidering everything. I picked up this as well as their earlier records, like a few of the other things. I'm only going to talk about this right now. This is the self-titled EP. This is something I kind of miss from back in the day. 20 years ago is like the tiny five inch or three inch CDs, especially the ones that were full size and had the clear outside, you know, a lot of those bridge nine CDs had this always really interesting graphic design. You know, you've got like fifties horror movie style stuff with this nice big fold out. Of course, this is them with their bug heads there. And the music is, is just incredible. It's incredibly singular, um, super influential, Really fun to listen to. It borrows as much from No Wave and Devo and Kraftwerk. There's, like I mentioned, these weird sci-fi keyboards over everything. Um, really avant-garde song titles and lyrics. Very sarcastic and satirical. Um, just incredibly bulldozing music. You know, kind of like snotty, screechy vocals. One of the funniest parts of the documentary that I, that I loved was uh, Justin Pearson lamenting about how he has to explain to people when he's a musician what kind of music he plays because he's like I don't want to say punk because somebody's just going to think like Rancid or Blink-182 so when a like a random person asks me what type of music I play I just say annoying 
<laughs> and it's true. I mean, a lot of this music that I'm going to be talking about, um, it can be just classified as super annoying, but it's very punk in that regard. So next we'll move on to the Some Girls record. This is like the newest record in this pile. This came out in 2004. And this is a cool project. This band did a few, not that many things. This was their first album. They did an album or two after this, a couple of records after this. And they had uh, two EPs or two demos or something collected before this. This is a project with Justin Pearson and Wes Eisold from American Nightmare and Cold Cave. Um, so it's kind of a meeting of the minds of uh, like hardcore dudes that really like post-punk, basically. And musically, it's, it's actually the most straightforward, traditional hardcore sounding, I'd say, out of anything else in this pile. It's... You know, it's got all those kind of uh, screamy elements that I mentioned in the beginning that are sort of uh, the batter that makes the cake of a lot of these. But it's got that sort of um, those tempo shifts. I'm reluctant to call them breakdowns, but basically breakdowns that are more atypical to 80s hardcore, not like chugga chugga hardcore. You know, think like the way Negative Approach would uh, kind of do um, do tempo shifts and stuff like that. But yeah, sort of like weirdly moshy in a way. Uh, they do a Stooges cover. Very, very cool band. Uh, yeah, I'm going to check out their other stuff. This is great. I felt like I should do, kind of explore some of the earlier stuff. My prior update where I talked about the emo stuff, talked about a lot of Gravity Records uh, stuff. I talked about Mohinder and Angel Hair and Heroin. I talked about them before. I had the CD discography on that one. Never really got into Antioch Arrow. And I felt like I should because I always hear that band mentioned with the San Diego emo stuff. Um, this is a compilation of their first two records. One is called In Love With The Jets. I am forgetting what the other one's called. It's an early discography. Um, and this stuff is a lot more mellow. It's not really screamy at all. Uh, those kind of discordant elements are there. There's a few faster tracks on here. It does have sort of like a noise rock feel, whether it's intentional or not. That's how it kind of sounds to me. I do know that there is a lot of love for death rock and post-punk in the San Diego scene, and you can kind of hear that as well. You know, especially when Bauhaus got kind of noisy, you know, I can I can hear that, that sort of lineage. There's a lot of kind of interesting groove, a nice kind of loud, clangy bass sound on this that I like a lot. Sort of like nasally, half-sung kind of vocals. I like Antioch Arrow. It's cool. It's a little bit of an acquired taste, you know, but I do dig it. Then you've got Jenny Piccolo, another San Diego band, uh, came out of the ashes of Mohinder. This is their discography on 31G. Tons of songs. Tons of songs. Some, like over 50 on this, it looks like. And, uh, you know, it's got that sort of grind approach where I doubt that th this is even approaching an hour long. Kind of, in a lot of ways, if I were to say what else this covers other than those kind of token, you know, scattershot rhythms and loud bass and kind of screechy vocals and all that kind of stuff. What what else this brings to the table is like more of like maybe a, more of a power violence kind of approach with the, the bass drops and the sudden shifts from very fast to sludgy. <laughs> This does that really well. This band, Jenny Piccolo, very cool. They did a lot of splits with, they did a split with the Locust, if I'm remembering correctly. They might have done a split with Ruin Nation or something like that. They were pretty prolific during their time. There's a lot of stuff on here, although the actual length of this is not really that long, so who knows? Let's see, we got Lowest Common Denominator EP, the split 10 inch with Asterisk, who we'll be talking about. Um, vocals by Justin Pearson on track 14. Death of the Salesman split EP. There's a Chain of Strength cover, which is dope on this. Yeah, so it's only a handful of uh, singles and an LP, but there's what appears to be like 60 songs on this. It's one of those kind of deals. Then, one of the best of the pile, a very big deal for this loosely related scene and sound, is Orchid. I'm so professional, I just used the iTunes window on my other monitor here to kind of bring a little bit more light to my face. I don't know how people use ring lights and not feel like they're blinded. I don't know. Maybe I should get over that. Anyway, Orchid just got all their stuff reissued. I talked about their self-titled uh, on the Metalcore update. 
This is the Totality CD, compiling all their splits and odds and ends and comp tracks. And the Dance Tonight, Revolution Tomorrow, slash Chaos Is Me CD, which compiles an LP and a 10-inch. Orchid, out of all the bands I'm talking about, probably the most sonically impactful, massive, epic-sounding stuff, really crushing overall sound sonically, big, huge minor chords, just a, a lot of weight to their music, um, overwhelming, <laughs> incredible, incredible stuff, you know, not, like, necessarily slow, like, they've got a lot of fast, speedy moments, but captures that the sort of off-kilter rhythms and, and makes them feel cohesive by how tight everything is and how um, just in your face the whole sound is. They're great. Um, Post-Orchid, there is a band called Bucket Full of Teeth with uh, a guy from a band called The Cancer Kids and two guys from Orchid, including Will Killingsworth. Will does a ton of production work and mastering work for newer hardcore bands, usually of the raw variety. You know, the, the monosyllabic, uh, echoey vocal kind of stripped down hardcore bands. He does a ton of work with them. If he hasn't produced them, he's usually mastered them. Does tons of stuff. Dead Air Studios has been around for a long time. Bucket Full of Teeth, if I'm remembering correctly, was his first band out of Orchid. Um, and this is a compilation that's three seven inches that came out on Youth Attack. All in 2002, three separate seven inches that were all released separately that's a lot of work um and this is also on youth attack and then a full length from a couple years later titled four one two three four which came out on level plane level plane was more to do with bands of this kind of sound later on in the 90s into the 2000s i think page 99 and majority rule and all that stuff was level plane stuff if i'm remembering right but this also is massive sounding um crushing kind of screamo stuff that incorporated a lot of big heavy riffs that the chaos is kind of going for a while and then usually kind of congeals into these massive like melvin's um torch kind of bulldozing stoner riffs <laughs> really really cool uh, enjoy that a lot then moving in a much faster direction asterisk from umia the not swedish hardcore sounding swedish hardcore capital of sweden sweden <laughs> umia where refused are from ds13 that that whole scene asterisk is from there um this is almost just straight up grind really i mean Rhythmically, it's, it certainly is. It's very, very fast. It goes on into the chaotic stuff here and there, but it's tons of blasting. <laughs> got sort of the screechy vocals, but also um, trading off with growls quite a bit. I'd say if you're into Brutal Truth, Past Need to Control, or shoot, I don't know, any of the discordance axis even, like some of the more experimental grind stuff. Um, you can't go wrong with Asterisk. Very, very cool. Um, just an edge of the kind of screamo y stuff, more, more grind. Uh, this also was put out by 31G. It's a discography of everything they did. Uh, then you've got Zagoda from here in North Carolina, tied in heavily with the Crime Think movement, which was like a neo situationist sort of left-leaning collective that also put out music spearheaded by the people from catharsis brian from catharsis this band this sound on this it's weird because it's more of a lightly distorted small amp kind of sound on the guitars which is not typical for this um and also i mean it's kind of a stretch to say that this band was in the same category as the others it just my brain when i was going on this buying spree felt like this was related the sense of epicness is definitely there they do a lot more it's a little less chaotic and a little bit more focused and they do a lot more stuff instrumentally there's um some very mellow instrumentals with um piano on this and some 
acoustic stuff going on too. Very, very weighty emotionally, the personal as political kind of deal going on with it. Cool recycled packaging, as is the style I was talking about earlier. Um, then you've got Shikari from Holland. Uh, this was recommended to me by a commenter. I'll put a little little graphic of that right here. Thank you, sir. This is uh, this is great compilation, 98 to 2003. Um, a lot of bordering on emo violence, really blazing fast stuff, but also enough quiet moments and enough kind of almost like noise rocky kind of shit going on with it where it feels a bit different from other bands that I'm talking about of the same ilk. Pretty memorable stuff. They do an Unbroken cover from the end of Unbroken's career when they were a lot more quote-unquote San Diego sounding than their more metallic straight-edge hardcore stuff from records previous. Uh, Clickatat Ikatawi. We've got another San Diego band here. This They were around from 94 to 97. This is the easily the most mellow stuff on here. It's not really screamy at all. I feel like the core of it, though, might be the sort of like groundwork that some of these other bands might go to sound-wise when the chaos subdues a little bit. Kind of the scronky bass and the sort of like lurching kind of rhythms. The vocals are clean, you know, they're sort of pained, semi-melodic. You could hear elements of post-punk in there too, post-hardcore, post-punk. Post everything, postal service, not the band. I tried to make a bad joke, I'm just gonna move on. Really, really good. Um, the drummer, I think on this, one of the members, Mario Rubokaba was a pro skater in the late 80s, really good skater. And he was in a bunch of punk bands, very well regarded. He was in Off with uh, Keith Morris there. He was in 411, which was one of my favorite, lesser known kind of early beginnings of post-hardcore. Almost like a meaner sounding West Coast Fugazi. Saying meaner sounding in Fugazi doesn't seem to make sense, but Dan O'Mahony from No For An Answer on vocals. Um, and he was in a big band that I'm forgetting that I feel like were desert rock or something massive that I'm omitting from the dude's discography, but he, he played in tons of stuff. Great drummer. Then we've got Ice Nine from Indianapolis, I believe. Um, this is their discography, kind of weird, jilted discography that, um, kind of an odd track listing with things feeling a little bit out of, out of place. My friend Grant, who is more familiar with this band, told me that, the uh, just the arrangement of the songs is weird on this. It sounds great to me. I have a bunch of their singles as well, separately. I haven't really compared and contrasted. They had a split with Charles Bronson and a split with Dahmer, I want to say. If that's right, that's really weird. But they have a lot of the raging fast, bordering on grind elements of um, these bands. Vocals that aren't the screechy and, and annoying kind either. More of a gruff, like hardcore guy kind of vocal. Um, but they do collapse into more mid-paced, almost noise rock stuff a lot of the time. And that's really enjoyable as well. Then Song of Zarathustra. This band from Sioux City, Iowa. Um, also part of the part of the sound that I think would mesh well with Orchid and some other bands that I'm not showing off because I didn't buy them recently, but bands like uh, Ordination of Aaron and Union of Uranus, where it's a very epic, massive, large, looming sound, particularly with this band, um, because they have like these really, really cool keyboards that add a lot of atmosphere to everything. Very cool and foreboding sounding. Then good old combat wounded veteran. Um, as you can see, this guy is throwing up his intestines. Uh, this is not anatomically correct. I can verify that, I'm a healthcare professional. I would only probably just be about like that much. There's a lot of intestines in your body, more so than you think, but not that many. 
Um, this is uh, this is not an erect all red neon body. Is the name of this? Came out on no idea. It's a compilation of everything other than their LP. I know a girl who develops crime scene photos, which was just reissued. Can't wait to get my copy in the mail. I just ordered it yesterday. Um, this band, I mean, if you want to pick out one band other than maybe, I'd say Guiana Punchline is another go-to as far as a beginner band. One of, something to check out if you want to explore this style. This band's very fast and straightforward. Again, those off-time discordant elements are there uh, for a little seasoning. You know, kind of screechy vocals. Certainly if you like power violence, if you like Charles Bronson in particular, I think Combat Wounded Veteran would treat you fine, treat you good. Very cool stuff, very short songs. You know, again, bordering on grind, bordering on uh, fast core, quote unquote. Great, great stuff. And then finally, Ashes. This is kind of shoehorned in, um, kind of like the Zagoda. It's like tertiary at best, kind of, uh, you know, Kevin Bacon degree of uh, relatedness and sound. I'd say the, the vocals sort of, um, well, the vocals, the main vocalist sounds like Natalie Merchant. Elena, I think her name was, um, beautiful, beautiful, like melodic vocals from her, but the backing vocals are that kind of like pain screaming that kind of is more hand in hand with all this stuff that I just talked about. Um, music ranges from kind of slow and brooding and sad to like more upbeat tempo that almost feels kind of pop punk here and there. Uh, interesting to say they're from DC. They were around from like 90 to 94 ish. I, I want to say does not really sound like the DC emo that came before it, in my opinion. Um, maybe a little bit like Embrace here and there. I mean, some of the bass lines or something, kind of, but, you know, not not really like uh, anything else. Um, yeah, it definitely felt very much like the, the melodic hardcore of that time, the early 90s, with some, you know, emotional hardcore touches, but a very good band holds a special place in my heart. I've heard certain people talk about them in the same way that they talk about bands like Into Another. Like, I liked that stuff back then, but I can't understand what's appealing about it now. Uh, the whole doesn't holds up thing. Um, that's all a matter of opinion. I, I like Into Another still, and I like Ashes still. It, it is of its time, but I think, you know, at a certain point, some people are gonna, younger people are probably gonna wanna check out stuff that was of the era and are probably gonna find something really special in this if they haven't already i don't know what people have my age or into so there we go it was really annoying obs shut itself off during uh, me talking about jenny piccolo i don't know if i bumped my mouse or what but i had to re-record about 12 minutes of that uh hopefully this doesn't do that stupid robot voice thing again i did get a new computer and it's brand new it's one of those mini pcs so i'm still kind of uh working out the kinks with stuff i'm not the most technically adept guy a little bit of a luddite over here so we're 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 working on stuff um more new equipment and more quality to, to come anyway that's enough talking for now no matter where you are have a good weekday weekend morning afternoon or evening middle of the night crack of dawn what have you gzs out